my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Peanut. Peanut is an app that helps you make meaningful connections throughout all stages of motherhood. Peanut provides a safe space for mothers, expectant mothers, and those trying to conceive to build friendships, ask questions, and find support by introducing you to others nearby who are at a similar stage in life. Peanut provides access to a community who is there to listen, share information, and offer valuable advice, whether it's understanding IVF, adoption, pregnancy, baby's first years, or beyond. Peanut is a place to connect with other moms in the thick of it. I've been loving using Peanut myself. I just signed up and you're able to go in there and choose what stage of motherhood you're at, whether you're trying to conceive or pregnant or have babies and what their ages are, and then it'll find groups for you to join with people near you or topic-based groups to get your questions answered. You can select a bunch of different interests and it's all super secure. And my favorite part is that it creates a special feed for you to go through and see people posting with similar things. So I tried it out just for fun with trying to conceive and saw that you know you could see people sharing their pregnancy tests and everybody giving their input. So it's kind of like a very personalized and focused version of other social media apps that you might use. So stay tuned at the end of this episode and I'll be talking to Trisha from Peanut all about the app. And you can download it for free today at thebirthhour.com slash peanut or by searching for peanut in the app store. Before we get to today's episode, I just wanted to give a quick update. I've heard from many of you that know that I'm from Austin, Texas, and we've been in the middle of this crazy winter storm. And we did lose power for a couple of days. It was quite cold, but we stayed huddled up in blankets and we're definitely some of the lucky ones here in Texas that our power is back on now, although intermittently sometimes. So I wanted to just say thank you so much with your patience. Over the last few days, we've replayed some of our fan favorite episodes from the past. These are episodes that are in our archives, so they're not necessarily on the public feed, but they are in our Patreon archives. When you join Patreon, you get access to all of those backlogged episodes, but every now and then we do some rebroadcasts, and this seemed like the perfect time for that since I didn't have access to internet and power for a while. So anyways, thank you for checking in. We are doing okay here in Texas, um, and we're just thinking about everyone else who is struggling during this insane weather event right now. All right, so let's get to Andrea's episode today. This is a rebroadcast from 2018. Today's episode is with Andrea, who's going to be sharing two birth stories. They were similar in length and amount of time pushing, but different in um, the way they got started. She talks about hypnobirthing and also shares her experience as a plus size mom. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for being here today. Hi, Bren. Thanks so much for having me. Can you tell listeners just a little bit about you? Sure. So I live in Sandy, Oregon, which is about halfway between Portland and Mount Hood. Um, I live with my husband, Alex, and our two kids are Emma, who is almost four, and Elliot, who is almost one. They're three years and one month apart. I'm a dietitian part-time, and my husband is a hygienist, a dental hygienist. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go back to your first pregnancy. Can you talk a little bit about finding out you were pregnant and how your pregnancy went? Yeah, sure. So kind of going back a little bit before that, we got married really young. I was 22 and my husband was 23. Uh, My husband was stationed in England with the Air Force. So right when we got married, I moved over there with him and lived there for two years. And we knew we didn't want to have kids overseas without our family. So we knew we were going to wait. I thought we were going to probably wait for a while. My mom had me when she was 30 and I just kind of thought that was normal. So we had so much fun. We traveled for two years in England and then we came home and my husband kind of surprised me. He said, like, let's just start trying. I want to have a a baby. And so I was like, okay. Um, You kind of always like go off of what happened to your mom, you know? So my mom, it took her a year to have me. So I was kind of expecting that, but we got pregnant pretty much the first month that we tried, um, which was great. It was like a pleasant surprise. So I was 
24, which I just think is so young, but it was great. So I had a, I had HMO, a big HMO here in the Northwest Kaiser, which I know, I think a lot of, I've heard a lot of stories on your podcast, people that have had Kaiser. So it's like all kind of in one, one in one group. So I knew I was going to be going there and giving birth there. I watched the business of being born pretty early on. So I kind of got a natural birth into my head. And also what happened to my, my mom with her birth, which I heard growing up, she had a very hard labor. She was in labor for, um, well, I don't know how long, but she pushed for four hours. I had to have like forceps. She had a really tough labor. And I was kind of like, I don't want to go down that route. I want to be more in control. I want to figure out how this work. So, you know, after I watched the business of being born, I I started to kind of research more natural births and what I could do. Yeah. So I kind of bounced around midwives. And then really early on in my pregnancy, I got a call from a scheduler at Kaiser and she said, oh, come in. We need to schedule you for your glucose test. And I was like, oh, really? Like I, I thought that wasn't for a while, like the second or third trimester, why am I coming in so early? And she just said, she said, uh, well, how much do you weigh? And I said, I told her and I heard her kind of talking to someone in the background. And then she said, well, because your BMI is so high, you have to come in early and get a test to make sure you're not at risk for gestational diabetes. And just kind of like the way she said it, was very shameful. I didn't receive that very well, but I didn't really tell her because I was just kind of shocked that she said that because no one had mentioned that to me before that I needed to do that. So her just saying that and asking for my weight, I don't know, it was, it didn't feel good. So actually, you know, thinking about it later, I got angry about it and I kind of wrote a message, like a complaint message almost, and um, did get a call back and I like got an apology for it, but it, it's unfortunate because it kind of like set off this anxiety in my head that I didn't have before about my weight and being pregnant. And like just for reference, I'm, I don't like to say like numbers or um, sizes, but like I was like a pretty typical plus size person. Like I could still shop in a lot of stores at the mall you know, by that time I had a degree in nutrition and exercise science and, you know, I just kind of felt shamed about my weight when they didn't know, you know, anything behind, you know, who I was. I went in for the glucose test. I think it was, I think I was like 15 weeks, maybe it was before I knew the sex and it was like four points high. And looking back, I can, I feel like a lot of that was just stress related because I was really stressed about it. But it was four points high, so I had to come back and do the three-hour test. And I was just so anxious about it and kind of got a little obsessive, which I think happens a lot in pregnancy when, you know, you're kind of told you have to be the healthiest for your baby. You know, women are very influenced in that stage of life because it's unknown. So I actually went... To the drugstore and bought a glucometer, which is what um, you use to check your glucose and your blood, your blood sugar. And I was kind of like testing myself a little too obsessively, like, you know, when I really didn't need to. You know, I was still being active like I always had been and eating how I always had. Um, but I went and did the three hour glucose test, and all they, they test you every hour for three hours. So it's three different times and all of them were fine. So I ended up not having gestational diabetes, but still I'm a little upset that that kind of got in my mind and made me anxious during my pregnancy because I was also told, you know, I, I should gain between 11 and 20 pounds, which I wasn't expecting either. And yeah, I don't know. It just made me off to kind of that start. I didn't want to be just like a lot of unnecessary like stress it sounds like yeah yeah and i i mean now as a dietitian like i know kind of those weight standards are kind of outdated and right. 
I wish I just would have just like listened to my body and, and knew my body's going to grow this baby. It's going to know how much weight to gain. Um, but in the meantime, I did find a midwife I liked. She was also plus size. So that, that made me feel a little better. And she never talked about my weight. And that was really great. I did do a hypnobirthing class here in Portland, which was so great. It was taught by Lori Rice, Rising, I think her name is. Um, it was a five-week course where you went every week for like three hours. And it was only me and my husband and another couple. And it was just so amazing. You know, I read the hypnobirthing book too, but doing the class and really learning the techniques and just being taught positions, like I, I was really happy with it. And I was really glad I did that. Yeah, so that was pretty much my pregnancy. I mean, it was it was really easy. It was like a typical first pregnancy. I didn't have morning sickness. It was just, yeah, smooth. All right. So um, had you at that point, I mean, you knew where you were going to give birth. Did you have much say in your care provider or was it like a group thing where whoever was on call is who you would have? Yeah, it's definitely whoever is on call is who you have. So there was midwives there and OBs. And so you could kind of say like, oh, I'd rather have a midwife. So that was in my birth plan. I did go over like typical first moms do. My due date came and went. I was at 41 weeks and I went in for a 41 week checkup and my midwife said, you know, I'm fine with you going over, but you should come in tomorrow and do a non-stress test. And I didn't want to do that. I kind of thought those can just lead to people saying to get interventions, which I didn't want to have at the time. So that day after my appointment was really early, I came home and I um, did the castor oil that you're not supposed to do really, but I did two tablespoons in like a huge glass of orange juice because I didn't want to get dehydrated. One of my friends had done it and she said it was it made her labor so hard because she was so dehydrated after puking and having diarrhea. So I was drinking a lot that day. You know, I had done everything previously, like the pineapple and oh spicy food, everything. So that was like my last effort. So that was early in the day, right on my 41 week day. And then I just like bounced on my birthing ball watch TV. I had quit work by 37 weeks, so I was definitely ready. I was also, I had got accepted to uh, do a dietetic internship, which is what dietitians do before you can sit for the exam. And my school started in August and this was, uh, this was late June. So I was just like hoping that I could, that she would come a little bit early so that I could spend more time with her. I knew I'd have to start my full-time internship in August, which made me sad. But yeah, so all that, I was just so ready to have her. So kind of later that day, I did. I think I did one more tablespoon of castor oil with a bunch of orange juice. And I did have diarrhea, but it kind of all came out at once and then it was done. So that was nice. And contractions started that evening, like right at 5 p.m., And I knew it was the real deal. I was so happy it was starting. Uh, My husband was in school at the time, and he had a night class that night, like from 6 to 8 or something. And I called him, and I said, oh, you know, I'm starting to have contractions, but I'm sure I'll be in labor forever, so you can probably just go to class, and it's fine. And uh, he was like... I don't know. I don't know if I should go, but just call me like right before class so I know for sure. And I said, okay. So I called him like five minutes before class was going to start. And I said, no, you should probably come home. Like these are coming pretty fast. Like I was timing them and they were pretty much every three or four minutes. So he came home. When he walked in the door, I was on all fours. That was just the best position for me at the time. It felt so good, but it kind of surprised him. And, you know, he called Kaiser and he, they listened to me and they said, yeah, you can probably come in. I was already kind of like 
having to work through contractions. This was about 6.30 p.m. But I just said, no, 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 I, I want to wait as long as I can so I don't, you know, don't get risk of having extra interventions at the hospital. So we waited until 7.30, which wasn't that much longer, but by then my husband was like, no, let's go. Like, I'm not... I don't want to have a horrible car ride. So we went in the car. I was listening to my hypnobirthing tracks. And it's just so funny looking back. Like during the contractions, I was just so zen. I was breathing, doing all the breathing techniques I was supposed to do. And then when I wasn't having a contraction, I was just yelling at him like, go, I can't believe you cut off that car. What are you, you're driving so terribly. But <laughs> we made it to the hospital it was probably 8, maybe 8.30. The hospital is about 45 minutes away. There's just this long hallway you have to walk down to check into labor and delivery. They probably do it on purpose. And I was stubborn. I did not want to have a wheelchair. I was like, I'm fine. I can walk. But right outside the entry, someone was smoking, and it just made my stomach turn. It just like made me feel so sick. But I walked down that whole hallway and right when I got to the end, I threw up all over the floor. <laughs> I don't remember much. I have like tunnel vision, but I remember my husband was just it was he was like running with like a chicken with his head cut off. He was like trying to find towels, trying to go to the bathroom and get paper towels. And I was like, just leave it. We need to check in. Luckily, the waiting area was only people waiting for labor and delivery, so they all knew what was happening. I got into triage. They checked me, which I was fine with, and I was at a four, which I was I was fine with. I thought I was managing okay. We got into our room, and, and I said, start the tub. I want to get in the tub. I wasn't going to have a water birth. Uh, you can't do that at Kaiser, but you can labor in the tub. So they were pretty quick. I feel like I got in the tub really fast. My husband got the room all set up. It was dark. We had our music playing. Yeah, we were doing the hypnobirthing techniques. I loved the light touch massage that they teach you. I feel like what I got from hypnobirthing was to just have all your senses filled so that you're not focusing on the pressure so much. So light touch massage for your touch sense and then, you know, breathing some kind of like aromatherapy in and listening to music. I really liked that. Yeah, so I was in the tub, and I kind of just went into labor land. I don't know how long I was there. I didn't know at the time how long I was there. They were really great about not... They they had my birth plan. We brought it with us. So they were great about respecting all of our wishes. We had to do, like, intermittent monitoring, which was annoying. The nurse... I was on all fours in the tub, and the nurse, you know, she always had a hard time finding the heartbeat, and... I remember at one point just being like, do you have to do this? This is so annoying. But she ended up getting it and it was fine. Yeah. And so a little while later on, I think I was in the tub for maybe like three hours. I just felt like I had to get out of the tub. I had this like urge to get out and go back to the bed. And at that point, my water hadn't broken to my knowledge, so and it was getting really intense. So I laid on my bed, and I just was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to get an epidural. It's getting so intense, and my water hasn't even broken yet. It's just going to get worse. Um, and I was bearing down at the time, and I didn't know. I didn't realize I was doing that. And the, the midwife saw me, and she said, can I check you? And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Um, and she checked me, and she said you're complete and your water bag isn't there. And I don't know. I've never heard of that happening to anyone, but I don't know when my water broke. It must've been in the tub and I didn't realize. Um, so I was, just, I was totally shocked when she said that. And she said, you're already pushing, which I didn't really realize. So they got all set up, got the kind of changed the bed around they knew I didn't want to be like coached to push. I just was kind of breathing through my contractions, like breathing down. Yeah. And so I pushed for probably, I think I started pushing at 12, 15 or 1230 in the morning, 
fishing was going well. They saw her head and they saw meconium staining. And everything kind of changed after that. So they said, and obviously, you know, if my water broke in the tub and no one saw it, I didn't have meconium in my water. They said, can we put an internal monitor on her just to make sure she's okay? And we can't really pick up her heart rate very well anyway, you know, with the external. So I said, that's fine. I was sick of having the external band on. So they put that on and they said, you know, her heart rate's dropping. You need to actually try to push. I think they were kind of sick or just done with me, you know, doing my little hypnobirthing breathing pushes. So they said, you you need to actually like tr- push and get her out because her heart rate's dropping. So I did. I pushed like as hard as I could with each contraction and she came out really quick. I tore for sure because I was pushing so hard. I ended up having a third degree tear. And then when her head was kind of crowding, the midwife was like, oh, her head is, is really big. Do you mind if I just cut a little episiotomy I guess they were just so concerned about her heart rate. And she said she was going to do it up and then to the left. So it was, I was tearing down. She, I think she could see that too. So she was trying to stop the tearing, which is good. And I said, yeah, that's fine. You can do it. And so she was born and she came out and I remember the midwife caught her. I saw her, her catcher. I saw the midwife go to cut her cord and I was like, wait, can we wait to do that? And I didn't realize, but the a whole team of people had come into the room since she had meconium. And the midwife said, no, I'm sorry, we need to assess her breathing. So I said, okay. And I laid back. The midwife cut her cord and they, they took her right to the side of the bed where her little bassinet was. So they didn't have to take her out of the room, but the respiratory therapist like assessed her and it was really quick. I was happy about that. And then they just put her right on my chest and she reached her head up so high and then just rooted up to my chest. And I, it was just, I didn't know little babies could lift their head up like that. It was amazing. Yeah. And so we had skin to skin, you know, for, for a while she breastfed and, you know, after the like very quick rushed ending, I, the midwife came after she had like stitched everything up and she came and like debriefed with me and she said why she, you know, wanted to cut the episiotomy and she said why it was kind of, kind of like rushed at the end with the meconium. And she, I was really appreciative that she did that. So I didn't have any like future regrets about what happened, but Yeah, that was just, it was great, the whole thing. So I started, my contraction started at 5 p.m. And she was born at 12.43 a.m., so a little over seven hours. She was 8 pounds, 14 ounces, and she was just over 20 inches long. I think she was 20 and three-quarter. Yeah, and she was perfect. And I was just on such a high after... That child, the the natural childbirth, I was just talking and chatting until like 3 a.m. It was great. Yeah, that's a pretty common little high when baby's sleeping. And you should be sleeping too probably, but it's so hard. It is. I just wanted to keep talking about what happened. It was amazing. <laughs> well, it sounds like a few things came up that you weren't, you know, planning on. But I love the way you told the story that they always kind of like asked you rather than just told you what they were doing. Yes. Yeah. They were so great about it. And, you know, the core person that's there with you is the nurse and she was so supportive of everything and so sweet. So I was just happy we got such a great nurse. Um, Yeah. And we didn't want to stay at the hospital long. We stayed for like a day and a half. I was lucky she latched on fine and we breastfed fine Yeah, and I did have to start school, like I said, really soon after she was born, which is sad, but it was only a 10-month program. Um, I think I started school when she was six weeks, but my parents, they each took like a month and a half off to stay with her, so she got an extra three months of just being with them, so that was amazing too. 
Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. All right. So then you had a little bit of a gap between the two kiddos. What was your that process like deciding to have another? Yeah. So we knew we wanted to have another. In between that time, I became a dietitian. I started working at WIC part-time, which is the program for women, infants, and children all across the country, women pregnant and postpartum, and then children ages zero to five. And that just really opened my eyes to how many women really struggle like I did with the weight stigma in pregnancy and just like our culture's obsession with women's weights, you know, pregnancy and postpartum. And and I know why, because even with my training for WIC, I, I kept seeing these statistics that, you know, plus size women have increased risk of C-section, they have worse pregnancy outcomes, they breastfeed less, there's worse outcomes for the baby. Uh, they're all, it's, all these things are so scary and all the solutions are really just to quote unquote catch these women before they get pregnant so that they can lose weight. And I just like couldn't wrap my head around that. I didn't think that was right. I was starting to learn about health at every size and intuitive eating. And I just didn't know how that kind of all came together. And then I just kind of realized, you know, it's, it's weight stigma. There's a good amount of research about weight stigma now and how it affects health. It does the total opposite of its intention. People that experience weight stigma end up having worse health. They exercise less. They eat more calories. They have definitely a worse mental health. So I was just, oh, like I thought that's why, you know, these plus size pregnant women are having worse outcomes because they're just, they're being stigmatized and they're not getting as good a health care as straight size people. Um, yeah, so I was so happy I learned that before my second pregnancy because I had zero anxiety about my weight, my second pregnancy, because I, I knew all that and I knew I was healthy and that, you know, these, these people that know me for a short amount of time don't know the whole picture. Um, yeah, so I kind of just got on a little crusade. I think anyone that hears that like life changing information, it just sticks with them and, you know, just learning diets don't work. People that lose weight on a diet regain it and more usually. I just seeing it like how much it affected women really stuck with me. Um, but it was a good thing. So we decided to start trying. Um, my daughter was, so she was pretty much three when we had him. So she was, about two when we started trying and, you know, again, it, we, it took like a month. So we were fortunate with that. We didn't have to wait at all, but this pregnancy was so different. I had the morning sickness horribly for the first 12 weeks, but I had to figure out like, what was I going to do? So I wasn't anxious about my weight, this pregnancy. And so I decided to not know my weight. I already hadn't known for a while before, but so what I would do, it was a little bit hard too, because the scale is in the lobby in the clinic I went to, which is really strange. <laughs> it, it's behind a curtain and you're supposed to, you know, weigh yourself, uh, print out your number and then hand it to the assistant, I guess, to just save them time. Hmm. But I didn't do that every time I came in and there was always a different assistant and I would say... She, she would call my name and she said, do you have your weight? And I would say, no, I don't want to know my weight. Can you just weigh me? And it was always fine. You know, they did. And I just turned around. Um, but that was, that was it. That was how I kind of got around that. And so I would definitely encourage anyone who is anxious about knowing those numbers when you're pregnant, like you can do that. You don't have to know your weight. Um, Pregnancy is a time where you need to be weighed, you know, otherwise a lot of times you don't at the doctor, but you can just ask to turn around. You can ask not to know your weight. And if anyone like gives you any grief, like if anyone said anything to me, I would have just said, you know, that's not good for my mental health to know that. 
And But luckily, it wasn't a big deal for me, even though I was kind of preparing for it to be. The pregnancy was harder, like I said. I could definitely tell I was getting bigger with this one, with him. Everyone was just saying, oh, yeah, boys are bigger. Um, I don't know if that was it or if it was just because it was my second pregnancy, but like my hips hurt so much worse by the end of it. You know, anytime I had to roll over in bed, I would have to wake my husband up for him to help me. Uh, It was a lot harder than the first time. I didn't do the hypnobirthing class this time around. I did read Mindful Birthing, which I really liked. But we were going through a lot of transitions and I didn't feel like I really had the money to spend on that. I was still just on call at WIC. My husband was finishing hygiene school. We moved in with my mother-in-law when I was like seven months pregnant to prepare for like the house buying process once my husband got a job. So yeah, there was so much going on. So I'm so glad I didn't have that extra anxiety of trying to like manage my weight, quote unquote. Um, Yeah, so that was pretty much that pregnancy. And then you were going to basically plan for the same type of birth? You know, I thought that for a long time. And then once this pregnancy by the end was just so much harder, I was kind of, I kind of just let it go. I said, you know, I'll I'll try for that. And if I need extra help, then that's fine. I kind of just was more relaxed this time around, maybe because I had that natural birth that I wanted. But I kind of, you know, I just wanted to let it go so I wouldn't feel bad whatever happened. So did you end up going late again? Yes. So they were both eight days late. He was too. You know, 40 weeks came and went, 41. She's, my midwife had the same midwife was, you know, giving birth at the same hospital. She said, you know, come in for a non-stress test. And, you know, the day she said that, I went home and did the same thing. I tried the castor oil and it didn't work. I had actually tried it at, right at 40 weeks too, and it didn't do anything. So that was another indication that for me, that this labor was going to be different. He, he just wasn't budging. Um, and she had tried to strip my membrane starting at like 38 weeks. She had started trying and he was always too high. He was never engaged. So I knew it was, I knew it was going to be different kind of, I think I had like an intuition. So I went in for the non-stress test. They were saying, Oh, you're having, you know, slight contractions and his heart rate's dropping a little bit with each contraction, you know, maybe you would just want to come and get induced. You can, And they said, you can come tonight. And it's just so tempting when it's right there. So I said, yes, like, let's do it. I want to just have this baby and not be in so much pain. It worked out perfect because it was a Friday night. So my parents could stay with my daughter all weekend. Um, so we came in at midnight that night after my non-stress test and they explained everything that was going to happen. I told them, you know, I wanted like the least dose of everything and try to do as natural as I can, but I wasn't so stringent this time. So we came in, I got the, uh, they give you miso or they gave me miso. It's just like a little pill that they put up, shove up your vagina, um, they gave me that at 1 a.m. I think I was I was dilated at a 1 at that time, and I think they were kind of being generous. So I would definitely wasn't in, like, active labor. Um, so I think, yeah, I was at a 1. They gave me that, and we slept for a few hours. And then they came and checked me at 5.30, and I was at a 3, so it was working. And they said, okay, let's just keep... Let's keep this going, and if you need Pitocin, we'll start it, but let's just wait and see. And the labor and delivery floor was busy that day, so they didn't really check on me all day, but it was great. There was actually a Harry Potter uh, marathon on TV, (laughs) so 
my husband and I, we were just hanging out and like laughing and watching Harry Potter all day. The nurses came in and, you know, every time it was like meal time and they said, oh, make sure to order breakfast, make sure to order lunch. So that was great. But by two that day, I hadn't really progressed past a three. And so they said, let's just start the smallest dose of Pitocin. And I said, okay, that's fine. So I I don't remember how much it was, but I remember when it kicked in, it only took about half an hour and there they were. I I know what people say now, um, Pitocin contractions are different. They're I don't feel like they're more intense, but just the fact that they come on, you know, every two minutes without stopping, you know, you don't get that progression with natural contractions where it kind of gets more and more intense and less and less frequency. But this was just right off the bat every two minutes. Um, I was on the ball for a while and I just felt like I couldn't get on top of them, if that makes sense. Like I couldn't use my techniques to manage them as well as I wanted to. So I said, okay, I need to get in the tub like right now because that worked so well the first time to relax me. So they filled up the tub. I was in there for a little while. I think this was around 5 p.m. And my contractions had started pretty much like 2.30. So I got in the tub and I, it still, it wasn't any better. It wasn't working like the first time. I was at a five though, so I was progressing a little bit. But the whole time I was in the tub, I was just so uncomfortable. So the midwife said, you know, maybe we'll um, break your water and it'll progress, you, you know, faster. And then we can just kind of speed it up. And I said, okay, yeah, let's do it. I wanted to do anything I could. So she broke my water. They had the external monitor or at that time, actually, I think I had continuous monitoring because I had, um, the small dose of Pitocin, which, oh, actually they took the Pitocin off when I got in the tub because I was progressing. I progressed to a five. So, but still they had to monitor every once in a while and, and they noticed the baby's heart rate dropped And I guess it was pretty significant. So they said, you need to get out of the tub. And it was right after they broke my water, his heart rate dropped. They said, get out of the tub, get on the bed on all fours. Um, I was just totally naked. I got out of the tub, got on the bed, and I felt like all the nurses in the labor and delivery ward were in my room at that point. Um, I had kind of trained my husband for this time around, I said, you know, be really involved, ask a lot of questions. And so he said, you know, what's happening right now? Can you tell me? And the nurse said, well, the baby's heart rate is about half of what it should be. So she, we need to like get it back up. And the midwife said, and if, you know, if this happens again, we might have to talk about a C-section. So, you know, I heard all that, but I was I was using all my hypnobirthing techniques and really trying to calm myself down and his heart rate did come back up, but I I couldn't get in the tub again. I didn't really want to because the contractions were so intense at that point. So, I went back to my room and you know, at this point it did feel, kind of feel like a cascade of interventions, but I mean, it was a different labor and I was fine with it. And I said, you know, these Pitocin contractions are so intense. I, th- I just need to try to get an epidural. And they were like, are you sure? And I was like, yes, yes, let's just do it. So the anesthesiologist came in. He was getting all set up. I remember he touched my back and his hands were so cold. And I just jumped. Um I don't know why that's just like a vivid memory, but it's just, it was the start of that whole epidural process, which did not go well for me. Um, He numbed up my back. I guess he didn't have enough or he didn't put enough lidocaine for me because he tried to put the epidural in and I just jumped and he kind of yelled at me. He said, you can't do that. You know, that's really dangerous. And I just was like, 
I'm sorry, you know, I'm having horrible contractions. And so he numbed me up more and he finally put it in. I was having like shooting nerve pain going down my left leg when he was putting in, which was so scary. And, you know, I was just like yelling like I didn't even yell when I gave birth either time. Like my husband said later, he was, that was the worst part. And it was for me too. It was scary and it wasn't even worth it because, you know, after it was put in, I was waiting and waiting and it only worked on my left side. It didn't even work on the whole, on my, both my legs. What did that feel like? It was strange. And they, they kept saying, oh, lay on your right hand side so it can kind of get dripped down there. And I was just like, no, I'm not going to lay on my right hand side for the rest of my labor. (laughs) You know, it did, you know, kind of cut half the feeling off and that was nice I think it was enough to just like help me relax and get a little bit in more control of my contractions and his heart rate never dropped again. So that's good too. Maybe I was just finally a little more relaxed at that point, but yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't end up like pushing any more into me. Like they give you the little thing to push to dose yourself again (laughs) because I was like, Oh, it's not even working anyway. So by the time I had him, it was it was pretty much natural, just like the first time. I did, um, after the epidural progressed pretty quick, I was at an 8 at about 9.30 p.m. or maybe almost 10, probably 9.30. But I again, I was, my body was just starting to push and... The midwife saw that, and so she checked me, and she said, you know, you're almost complete, but there's a cervical lip. Can I push it out of the way? And I said, yes, yes, that's fine. (laughs) So we got ready for the pushing stage. It was funny. I started to get really nervous because I told him, you know, I, I don't know how to push. The first time I just pushed way too hard and fast. I don't want to tear again can you please just teach me how to push? And they were so great. They had little warm cloths that they kept putting down there to help with tearing. And they said, of course, you know, we'll teach you how to push. They put a bar up over the bed. It kind of went on both sides and then on top. They had me put both my feet on the bar and then they, they got a sheet, just a bed sheet, put it around the bar and I held it with my hands. So I was kind of like, that just gave me the force to push down so well. And I loved it. And, um, I, the hospital had just got nitrous oxide. So I said, yeah, like, let's try this during pushing that maybe something will work. It was kind of annoying. My husband was a hygienist at that point. So he was registered to give people nitrous, but I had to administer it myself. So I would do my push, hold onto the sheet, bear down, they were, they were just telling me, you know, push one, two, three and counting. Then I would like let everything go, like take a couple things of nitrous and then have to get back set up again real fast. So it was a little annoying doing all that. Um, by the end, the midwife was like, it's fine. You can, your husband can just put it on your face. So I was like, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, I think it helped a little, I don't know, since I had to keep taking it off, you know, I don't know if it was worth it either, but yeah, so it was funny. I remember they, they kept saying one more push, one more push. And I know they were being encouraging, but I was like, really? It's just one. And I was like, Alex, look down there. Like, is he there? And Alex was like, no. (laughs) So I was a little annoyed with that too. I was like, don't lie. It's not one more push. But again, just with Emma, I pushed for 20 minutes. He was born a little bit after 10 p.m., so about eight hours again. And he came out, and the midwife, the first thing she said was, he's so big. And we let the cord, you know, get white. They put him right on my chest. They didn't have to take him away. It was so nice. Yeah, and he just sat with me and breastfed for like an hour, 
it was nice. They didn't have to take him away real quick and weigh him. You know, they did pat him down. But all that time I was breastfeeding, we were all taking bets about how big he would be. <laughs> um, and my my daughter, like I said, she was 8'14". So I thought, oh, I bet he's like a big 9. And they put him on the scale and he was 10 pounds, 12 ounces. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and he, he was 22 and a half Whoa. inches long. <laughs> Oh so goodness. he was a giant. Um, none of the newborn clothes we brought fit him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my aunt visited in the hospital and she brought us a three month outfit. So that's what he went home in. Um, yeah, it was amazing. I couldn't believe he was so big. But that's funny. yeah. We were in the hospital a little bit longer. I kind of wanted to just relax in the hospital, not quite go home yet. His latch wasn't as good as Emma's. He, I, I got blisters and bleeding kind of right away. He was, his latch was a lot more shallow. So anytime, I told the nurses, like, anytime a new lactation consultant gets on, just send her in here. And I think I saw three when I was at the hospital, which I loved. And I would encourage, you know, anyone in the hospital to do that because it's such a good resource. Um, so I got all their help. And Did you ever find that you were getting, like, conflicting advice? Because I've heard that before, too. I did. I definitely, I think I got some conflicting advice. But I would just take what worked for me. And I think there was one in particular who was a little bit older who gave me the best info. So I was just happy to get whatever they had to say and then try it out and see what worked. Yeah. I feel like support in general, when you're just kind of like, even as a second time mom, you're still kind of awkward and figuring it all out again. And just having someone there other than like a man who's never done it before um, Mm -hmm. to kind of just support you is really huge too. Yeah. Yeah. So I was really happy for that and I'm glad that, you know, that resource is there. Um, but we figured it out and he breastfed longer than Emma did. Um, both of them, you know, once I started with Emma, once I started school and then with him, when I started work, like pumping was just really hard and made my supply go down, you know, just little bits at a time. So both of them, I lasted like three months of pumping, but yeah, I, I didn't, you know, with the second time I didn't feel bad about it. I was like, you know, that's okay. I, I did as much as I could. It's fine. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was a birth. Yeah. All right. Well, did you have any resources that you wanted to share? Yeah. Um, so during my pregnancy, especially my second pregnancy, um, I loved the Jen McClellan plus size birth community. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah, she's so great. And she's been on the podcast and has like so many awesome resources on her site too. She does. She has so many good ones. I just saw a post from her today about plus size baby carriers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. I wish I would have done that, you know, when I was still doing, when I was still carrying them. Um, But yeah, I would definitely recommend that. She actually has a new podcast which just started, I think, a couple weeks ago, and it's really great. It's called the Plus Mommy Podcast. Mm -hmm. And just from, like, piggybacking off of that, I would just go on Instagram and just search the hashtag plus size pregnancy. And that was so helpful for me, just seeing people that looked like me pregnant, you know, not just, like, the stereotypical, like, you know, Hollywood kind of pregnancy, but... That was really helpful for me. And just like anyone, seeing someone that you look like is so helpful. So I love doing that. I love podcasts. And I got into the birth hour with my second at like 32 weeks. And I was so happy I did because it really helped me kind of connect with him more. You know, that second time around, you kind of worry, like, am I going to connect with him as much as my first? But it really helped me with that. So I was really happy I found your podcast. But other than that, the Nurtured Mama podcast I love. And I think you've had Lindsay Stenovic on the podcast too. 
not birth related, but I love the Food Psych podcast, which is all about intuitive eating and health at every size. And Lindsay Senevec has been on there and talked about pregnancy and kind of all those, you know, food things that go in with that. Um, another good one from the Food Psych podcast is with Kylie Mitchell. She talks about being pregnant in this kind of like diet culture that we live in. Um, yeah. And I, I mentioned the hypnobirthing book, the mindful birthing book. That's pretty much it. All right. I'm excited. There's a couple podcasts there that I haven't been listening to. I'm going to check out. Um, and we'll share all of those on the show notes page too, so people can find them because you had a nice little list there. Did you want to share where people can find you if they want to connect? Sure. So you can find me. I have a nutrition, like intuitive eating Instagram. Um, it's Andrea Marie RD, which is A N D R E A M A R I E R D. And then my email, if anyone wants to connect, is just my full name, Andrea Marie Cox. And Cox is C O X at gmail.com. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll share those both as well. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us today. Yes, thanks for having me. Okay, now we're going to chat with Trisha from Peanut, today's sponsor. And don't forget, you can go to thebirthhour.com slash peanut to get a direct link to download the app, or you can search for it in your app store and download it for free today. Hi, Trisha. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Peanut. Hi, how are you? Doing well. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do for Peanut? Sure. My name is Trisha Bowden, and I lead the Peanut Ambassador MVP program. So our MVPs are our most valued peanuts, and they're basically our feet on the ground. They're helping to spread the word about the peanut community and to help us grow. That sounds like a lot of fun. I bet it's changed yeah. a little bit during uh, the pandemic. It has, but it's gotten more interesting. I mean, it's a very unique ambassador program where these are just, you know, our everyday users. It's not, um, it's unlike your typical ambassador programs where you look for, you know, influencers and followers. These are really just women who are going through different life stages, whether it be um, trying to conceive or um, pregnancy and motherhood, and are just really trying to help spread the word and provide the support. And we give them the flexibility of hours and they get, they get compensated um, for it. So it's a really great opportunity for them. Very cool. Yeah. I'm always amazed by the power of like a mom spreading the word just yeah. <laughs> online or in person. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about Peanut and just what it is and how it works. Sure. Um, so Peanut is really an app that helps you get through all stages of motherhood. So from the very moment that you think about becoming a mother, when you're trying to conceive or navigating fertility, to expecting and being pregnant, um, through going through adoption processes and surrogacy, and of course, you know, being a mother, um, Pina provides that support. And what we do is we really help connect women to one another who are in the similar life stages. Um, for me, it was, you know, I was a new mom and I was looking for um, a friend that was nearby that had a child the same age where we could just meet up at the park and kind of connect on different experiences that we were going through. But other times women are really navigating very specific circumstances and we're able to kind of find the right person to connect you with to help you get through that. So you can get that support, ask questions. And alongside that, um, outside of connecting you with woman to woman, it's uh, support groups. So there's lots of topic groups, um, such as expecting, fertility, postpartum support, where you can really find like your pretty much like group of moms and your community. Um, there's also some serious topics that the groups center around, like abuse, um, mental health issues, and then things that um, some moms just find a really hard time um, relating to, which is, you know, raising a child with special needs. 
Yeah, I think it's really cool how specific it gets. When I created my account, it asks like all your different in- interests and there's so many to choose from. And then I just played around with it a little bit to see what the different options would lead me. So I tried the trying to conceive option and it shows me this personalized feed of other people who are kind of in the same stage, which is so cool. And then I tried it for pregnancy and it allows you to put in how many weeks along you are. And then it's showing people who are, you know, similarly Yes. you know, 16 weeks long and that kind of thing. And it's like almost like a personalized feed that you would see on another social media app, but it's, you know, takes it to another level. And then I imagine, I mean, I can tell from the way that it worked to sign in that it's much more uh, secure and private. Can you talk about that aspect? Yes. So um, the women on our platform are really protected by our safety measures. I mean, we don't let anybody on the platform unless they're verified And it's really a place where you can talk about anything. Again, back to very simple, just getting tips on motherhood or raising your child or, you know, is this normal? I'm at X, um, you know, my ninth month of pregnancy and I'm feeling this. The things that are a bit more private, um, even issues around sex, which can be fun, but also very serious. Mm -hmm. Um, We make sure that we protect our users and that, um, you, you know, you have the option of being incognito if that's something that makes you feel comfortable Um, But it really is a safe place where you can open up and find that support where on other platforms you wouldn't. Right. So one of the ways it seemed like the verification was happening was through, it had me take like a selfie. It was, you know, it said, this is not anything that's going to be put on your profile, but we just want to see that you're a real person. So that only works in that moment through your phone versus someone like uploading a selfie, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Okay. So there's a few different features, like you said, the groups and the support, but then there's also this ability to, you know, make a one-on-one friend, like maybe a dating app. So can you explain how that works? Right. So when you um, first download Peanut, you're basically creating your profile and you're indicating certain things about yourself, like where you live, um, different interests that you like. Mine personally is like wine time, food first, that's all me. And then you can indicate what stage you are in terms of your journey through motherhood. So whether you're trying to conceive um, a mother and how old your children are or pregnant, uh, we will basically introduce you to moms that are at the similar life stage and in your location if you choose. You also have the option of expanding um, your location. But really, that's what it's about is like matchmaking on the level of finding someone to go along that journey with that you can relate to, that you can ask questions to, and that can support one another. Yeah. It seems like it's very, um, like the, the intelligence behind it is very specific with finding the right groups for you. When I signed up, it like knew my neighborhood group, not just my city and, you know, sent me an invitation if I wanted to join that. So making, you know, those connections really close to home, which is very convenient when you have weird nap schedules and all kinds of things going on with kids. Especially if you're pregnant, um, what we're doing now is we're calling it Bump Buddies, is when you do download Peanut and you indicate your birth month or expected due date, um, we will automatically put you in a group with other women with the same due date. So that's that's just a really um, great thing to do because at that point you're already in a group with so many women that are going through likely the same thing as you. Um, so that's when kind of like you really need it most. That's cool. So working with the ambassadors, have you heard any really great stories that you want to share or ways that people love to use the app more than, you know, all the other ways or anything that stands out that you want to share? Sure. There's actually a really interesting um, story about one of our MVPs. She's in New York City. Um, Her name is Sam. And she is pregnant with her second child or was pregnant with her second child during COVID, right? Her due date was in May. And unfortunately, um, none of her family from out of state could come in to help. And her husband was a doctor. So it really was kind of like a crunch time for her to figure out what is she going to do with her toddler if she has to go in for delivery, you know, at an unexpected moment. So she had met another woman on Peanut um, in, in a similar neighborhood to her, adjacent to hers in New York City who happened to also become an ambassador and they became such great friends that when she did give birth, she asked this mom, this fellow MVP to come in and watch her son while she was in the hospital. And she did. And that was just such an amazing story. So sweet. She took pictures of when she gave birth at the hospital and 
she had such a proud look in her face. They were beautiful. And she shared these pictures and her story about meeting this uh, wonderful friend on Peanut across all of these other social um, groups that she's part of. And that actually really, you know, emotionally triggered these women. And they saw what the power can be when you have a great support system. And it actually helped her um, grow the Peanut community. That is so cool. I just got yeah. goosebumps hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that really speaks to the whole it takes a village aspect that's so hard to find these days when we move around a lot and maybe aren't, you know, staying in the same city our whole lives. So I love that y'all are helping make those connections happen. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, you can you might use peanut in different ways when you're at different stages in your life. And I've kind of been through a few um, I joined Peanut in 2017, um, right after I had my son. We lived in California. He was one years old, and we decided to move back to New York, where our families were. But I didn't have any mom friends with um, children the same age, and I was really like, I need to find a mom friend. So right. as we all need found, I Googled like making mom friends, and I came across Peanut. And then that's how I, I got on the app and I was able to make like a couple of mom friends I could just go to the park with and, and, and hang out and have play dates. And it was really great. After that point, I kind of just got more into the community groups and just looking for advice on the different milestones that occur between the ages of like one and two. And then I found myself using peanut for another reason, because we were trying to conceive again and having, having our second child. And unfortunately, um, I had a miscarriage, which just even changed the way that I use peanut more so because then I was really, I found out I had a uterus abnormality, which I had never heard of. So naturally I was just looking for others who mm-hmm. might have the same thing or have heard of it or could shed any, you know, advice. And it, what was so great um, within peanut is that I found very specific groups um, that were created by women that had the same thing, but they all were trying to, keep all the support in like a a positive manner Mm. there weren't any you know negative stories about that everyone was just like it's it's going to be okay um you know I have the same thing but look what turned out I have like this beautiful son and and that was that was so important for me because I had this miscarriage right in the beginning of COVID so I really needed it (laughs) Yeah, that's so, so important to be able to find that support. And like you said, like a positive place versus maybe Mm -hmm. going down a Google rabbit hole or something. Right. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I really appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you so much, Bryn. Thank you so much again to Andrea for sharing her birth story and to Peanut for sponsoring this episode. You can easily download the Peanut app by clicking the link in the show notes or just going to thebirthhour.com slash peanut and it'll redirect you right to your app store. If you want other information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Andrea's name in the search bar. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.